Hello, everybody, and welcome to this month's edition of the Sustainability Practice Group for CSI. I'm going to hand over to uh, one of our co-chairs of uh, the practice group, Richard Moore, to do the formal introductions for today's presentation. Thanks, Matt. Welcome to the October session of the Sustainability Practice Group. My name is Richard Moore, co-chair of the C CSI group. Today's topic will be avoiding toxic chemicals in buildings, presented by Nadav Malin, president of Building Green, and Paula Melton, managing editor of Environmental Building News. Today's format will be a 45-minute PowerPoint presentation followed by a short Q&A from the audience. As president of Building Green, Nadav oversees the company's industry-leading information and community building resources, including Environmental Building News, its sister publication, Greenspec, and the project certification help to lead user. Mayland is also the executive editor of McGraw-Hill's Green Source magazine and was founding chair of the Material and Resources Technical Advisory Group for LEAD. Paula Melton is managing editor of environmental building news and frequent blogger on the buildinggreen.com where her shop wit and critical eye cut through greenwash on a daily basis. This session is an overview of Building Green's Avoiding Toxic Chemicals in Commercial Building Projects, a handbook of common hazards and how to keep them out. Nadav and Paula were editors of this handbook and I can attest to its concise and useful information in writing specifications. For those attendees who are AIA or GBCI members, you can earn eight learning units by taking its companion quiz. Nadav will now begin the presentation. Thank you, Richard. So, um, yeah, Paula and I are thrilled to be here doing this presentation and look forward to uh, sharing a bunch of information with you and then um, having some conversation, hearing your questions about it. Um, so you've already seen the topic, and there we are. Uh, Richard just introduced us. Uh, the learning objectives that were set up for this program um, are essentially to understand health hazards and opportunities throughout the material choices that you might make uh, for a project. Um, and in particular, we're going to focus on um, categories of chemicals that have been targeted for avoidance, explain a little bit about why they've been targeted, what some of the options and opportunities are in terms of choosing to avoid them, as well as uh, limitations in the current tools and resources we have, so you can um, get a, an understanding of how to uh, how to make better choices or what's coming along, what, what's still needed to provide better tools so we can make better choices in the future. Okay, so in the next hour or so, we'll look at different attitudes toward toxic chemicals, which range from fatigue to phobia, and we'll talk about what we know and don't know about the chemicals and how they can hurt us. Then we'll look at some ways to cope with those knowledge gaps, and we'll also discuss some case studies from project teams who've had some really exciting successes with toxic chemical avoidance. Some of what we'll talk about here is drawn from our recently released handbook, Avoiding Toxic Chemicals in Commercial Building Projects. It hones in on the most common hazards and how to make good decisions that help your clients have healthier buildings and also help the industry build more sustainable buildings. And you can learn more about that handbook at buildinggreen.com slash chemicals report. So with that, it's time for a pop quiz. Even if we try to ignore it, we are constantly barraged with information about dangerous chemicals in our food, our water, our dust, our air, even our grocery receipts. The information is often sensationalized, always incomplete, and sometimes downright contradictory from one day to the next. Let's take a look at different ways people approach this situation. Are you a chemophobe, or do you like to live dangerously? Um, so we're just going to go through some questions, and then we'll talk about um, your approaches to toxic chemicals um, later on in the talk. Um, so first, for the quiz. Oh no, you forgot to make a treat for your kid's birthday. The only brand of brownie mix has several ingredients your fifth grader is unable to pronounce. What do you do? A, what's the problem? If it were that bad for you, it would be illegal. B, buy it, but add sugar, uh, sorry, add butter instead of margarine because you never eat trans fat. C, buy it, but leave off the technicolor icing where most of the chemicals seem to be. Or D, mix, are you kidding? I make them from scratch using eggs and stevia from my own backyard and butter hand churned in organic Montessori schools. 
Okay. So take note of your answer, and then we'll tally them up at the end. Okay, next question. You're planning a new look for your bathroom, but you have a tight budget. Which kind of flooring do you choose? A. Vinyl is the cheapest. Fun colors, too. B. No way you'll pick vinyl. Oops, but you forgot to look at what was in the adhesive. C. Vinyl is okay if the flooring and adhesive are certified for low indoor emissions. And finally, D. Natural cork all the way and moisture issues be damned. Okay, just write down your letter for that one and we'll move on to the third and final question. A new study suggests that triclosan, a biocide used in many soaps and other products, is not only an endocrine disruptor, but also inhibits muscle function. How did you react to this news? A. I'll keep using triclosan until the government bans it or my muscles give out altogether. B. Eek! I can't decide if I'm more scared of the germs or the chemicals. C. I stop buying products that have triclosan listed as an ingredient. Or D. I make my own Castile soap out of biodynamic extra virgin olive oil. Okay, so if you know your answer, we'll go on to the next slide and just tally those up and we'll look at them again later. Um, so if you, for every A answer, give yourself zero, for B answer, one point, and so on. Um, and just keep track of your number for um, later on. Okay, so meanwhile, we just want to emphasize that there's not one right approach to toxic chemicals in your life. It's a little crazy out there. Every day we learn about something new that's killing us. Our hostile workplace, sleeping pills, the caffeine you took to recover from the sleeping pills, your multivitamins, and that's just to name a few from a quick Google search. It's easy to give up and completely tune it out or to take the opposite approach and live with constant anxiety. A lot of us do both or go back and forth between them. There are a lot of reasons for that. For starters, the science itself has serious limits. And in the building industry, we have so many ways of getting partial information that it can be really hard to pick just one. There are a lot of reasons that it's hard to understand the effects of chemicals in our health, and here are just a few of them. First of all, you can't just go around feeding poison to people just to find out what happens. We have to use animals for these experiments, and even if we put ethical issues with that aside, the kind of data that we get from that is imperfect, particularly with chemicals like endocrine disruptors, which even toxicologists don't really understand all that well yet. And then when we do have information about which chemicals make humans sick, it usually comes from really high long-term exposure in an occupational setting where it's a small population of pretty similar people. That kind of exposure, the kind of exposure that gives people diseases like black lung, for example. Well, that's a solid starting place as far as data is concerned. It doesn't tell you how much exposure is too much for a different kind of person, like a child, or what other effects the chemical might have at lower doses. So we still have to fall back on animal studies to get more of that data, and it takes time. Okay, also in the earliest days, toxicology mainly studied acute exposure, meaning what kind of sickness might result when you get a whole bunch of something at once. Later, it focused on carcinogens, which typically have an effect due to chronic exposure, but still it's usually the case that the higher the dose, the more likely you are to get cancer. But we're still learning about other kinds of toxic effects, like from chemicals that don't cause any problems at all in the short term, and some that seem to be more toxic at low doses than they are at higher doses. And finally, studying the interaction of just two chemicals in a laboratory is very complex and expensive. We have pretty much no idea what happens when you swim around in a sea of low doses of chemicals day after day over a whole lifetime those conditions would be almost impossible to replicate in a lab. That's why in many ways we are the guinea pigs, particularly with new hazards we don't know much about yet. After this presentation, if you want to dig deeper about toxic chemicals, this book is a great way to educate yourself. You get a very balanced scientific perspective on the media hype about the dangers of chemical exposure, 
as well as an understanding of how little we know about certain types of chemicals. The book is called Toxicology for Non-Toxicologists by Mark Stellius. Okay, um, so let's talk about some of the ways that we, who are definitely not toxicologists, try to get information. One of the first places people go to is a material safety data sheet, also called an MSDS. These are required for certain materials, but not all of them. People tend to assume these are a comprehensive list of all the hazards in a product, but as we'll see in a minute, that's not really the case. Then there are red lists, which are an attempt to compile information about the worst possible hazards and then minimize their use in building product projects. But which hazards are worst? We'll see in a moment that not everyone agrees about that. Then so-called multi-attribute product certifications look at a whole bunch of sustainability-related features of a product. They don't necessarily tell you much about health hazards, health benefits or hazards, although some of them do. And like certifications, environmental product declarations look at a lot of different aspects of a material or product. But human health and ecosystem disruption usually aren't looked at very thoroughly. Then you have different building rating systems like LEED, which look at toxicity too, but not very comprehensively right now. This may be starting to change, and some of you have probably seen our coverage of how the chemical industry is reacting to these changes in LEED. But even when they start to address toxic toxicity more directly, you can't rely on a building rating system to help you evaluate every single product. Certifications and rating systems are a big topic all their own, so we'll just mention them and leave those aside for today. A really simple way of finding out what's in certain products is just to look at the required VOC label. And there's also voluntary testing for VOC emissions. Nadav will talk more about the strengths and weaknesses of VOC content and emissions labeling in a moment. So just to look at a few of these right now, um, here's a, materials, a couple of material safety data sheets side by side. This first one is a small screen capture from a multi-page MSDS for Gorilla Glue. And although we're not too impressed with a couple of these ingredients, there's a lot to like here. The MSDS is readily accessible on the company's website. And it has really clear details about everything in the product and how each thing might harm a worker who is applying the product on the job. A lot of people don't realize that that's what an MSDS is actually for. And that's why it focuses on carcinogens and acute occupational hazards. But as you can see in the second MSDS here, for a product we decided not to name, you don't have to declare everything that's in your product. You only have to report the stuff that you added on purpose and that is in the product above a certain level. Whatever is in the product, it apparently wasn't there above the required reporting levels because this MSDS just keeps saying, no information, no information, no information. As health advocates are quick to point out, no information is not the same thing as no hazards. So as Paula um, mentioned earlier, one of the tools that people rely on a fair amount are red lists. And red lists are essentially lists uh, that a particular program or organization suggests should be avoided or requires that you avoid to meet certain, um, certain requirements of the program. Uh, this particular one is from the Living Building Challenge, which is a, a green building certification program from the Inter International Living Future Institute. And um, as you can see, there's a fair number of um, items on that list that are very common in building materials. So avoiding all these things in a project uh, is pretty close to impossible. Uh, the Living Building Challenge gives you some leeway to uh, work around those requirements if you have to, but they, they really do drive people to try to avoid them where they can. Um, but that's really not the only red list out there. So let's look at a little bit of history here. Um, when LEED first came out about a dozen years ago, it had its own version of a red list. It had certain um, ingredients, certain chemicals that you had to avoid um, in the case of halons or CFCs uh, for the building to be certified at all because those are prerequisites, or that you had to avoid if you were going to earn certain credits in the system, like uh, products with VOCs over a certain limit or any added urea formaldehyde. So that was kind of a beginning. And then um, 
program came along called the Green Guide for Healthcare, which added a whole bunch of other ingredients to a list uh, of products to be avoided, at least to, to earn certain credits in the system. Um, starting to get into many more common uh, elements, ingredients that are common in many more building materials. And um, these are uh, showing up here gradually, so we'll see them all in a minute. Um, next, we have Lead for Healthcare, which was built on the Green Guide for Healthcare, and um, but it didn't include everything in the Green Guide for Healthcare. It added a few other things that were not. So it's creating its own flavor, its own uh, various variant on the Green Guide for Healthcare list. Pulling these up one at a time here. Um, now you can see how the Living Building Challenge list overlays with those. Again, it includes so some overlap. It includes some of the chemicals that are on those lists, but not others. And then uh, Perkins and Will created something they call their precautionary list. And the precautionary list, um, again, it includes a lot of materials that are on these other lists, uh, omits a few of them, and adds a few more of its own. So now you've got yet another list to try to keep track of. Um, finally, almost finally, we're getting here. EPA has the chemicals of concern list that um, has a little bit of overlap with some of these and adds yet another category. And then um, putting all of these together, the most comprehensive list we've been able to find is something called the Clean Production Action uh, Red List. And so um, Clean Production Action and the Healthy Building Network came up with this uh, fairly comprehensive list that's part of what they call their green screen for toxic chemicals. And this is actually being cited in uh, lead version 4 that's now out for public comment. So that's worth taking a look at. Um, but it, uh, it's a pretty long list of, of chemicals. And to be fair, lead isn't actually suggesting that you avoid all these chemicals in your building. They're just using this as a, as a benchmark for chemicals that would trigger a reporting requirement if you're going to earn that particular credit. So. If anyone tells you, LEED tells you, you must avoid all these credits to have a LEED building, that's not true. Um, if LEED version 4, if and when LEED version 4 um, becomes the active version, then you will have the option to declare whether, whether any of these chemicals are in your project in order to earn a particular credit in the system. So that's the way uh, that particular red list works. And the main point here is just it's become um, quite an array of different materials to try to keep, or different lists to try to keep track of. And so um, clearly we could use some help here keeping up with all of this. Um, so how do you deal with all of that? How do you deal with this kind of uh, tangled web of overlapping lists? Well, one important thing is to focus on a few key hazards and essentially figure out where your priorities are or your client's priorities on your particular project. There may be certain things you care more about. And so we can suggest a few priorities here to you. Um, one thing to start with, think about, is carcinogens, um, ob for obvious reasons. Um, anything that's going to cause cancer or increase the risk of cancer is worth watching out for. Um, next on our list is reproductive and developmental toxicants. Uh, and Again, these are things that are going to, like the name suggests, are going to affect people's reproductive systems or the uh, development in, uh, in, developing, um, in developing brains, developing bodies. And then the endocrine system as well is, is worth watching out for in particular. A few other categories to keep an eye on, but we're not going to go into as much detail on them here, are uh, neurotoxicants, mutagens, things we call mut cause mutations in cells and then asthmogens, allergens, uh, general um, sensitizers to the respiratory system. So that is a way to kind of get a handle on some of these is instead of looking at just the chemicals themselves, to think about them in terms of the categories, the categories of the impacts they cause. And um, it's also good to know a little of the terminology here, which is whether you're talking about um, what we're talking about here are what are sometimes called toxicity endpoints, 
which are again the end result or the, the, the feared result, the undesired result that might happen through exposure to these chemicals. So, so that's one way of categorizing these, and we're going to go into a little more detail about, about those first three categories now. Paula? Okay. Um, so first we're going to look at carcinogens, and there are a lot of these in our environment, including in our building materials. And um, by the way, that photo from the Science Photo Library is actually a lung cancer cell, even though it looks really pretty. Um, so carcinogens are chemicals that cause, promote, or aggravate cancer. And the effect of a carcinogen on an individual person depends on a lot of factors like the person's susceptibility, how much of the carcinogen actually gets into their system, how it gets in, like whether you breathe it or eat it, and whether exposure is acute, which means it happens just once or maybe a few times in a short period, or chronic, which means that exposure happens consistently over a long period of time. And toxicologists define that usually as 10% of a lifetime, which is about seven years for humans. Um, and since some people, some animals have long lifetimes, there's also a category called subchronic, which is longer than acute exposure, but is less than seven years. So most of the time with carcinogens, we're going to be talking about subchronic or chronic exposure. That said, um, in theory, there is no safe dose of a carcinogen. And we don't really know the smallest amount it might take to cause cancer in a very susceptible person. In practice, though, tiny amounts of carcinogens are all around us in nature and in our food, our water, and our buildings. And of course, if you listen to the chemical industry, we have formaldehyde in our breath, and so therefore we can't call it a carcinogen, but it is. Um, it's, it, the fact that it's all around us doesn't mean it's not a carcinogen. So what we need to do is find ways to establish exposure levels that we find acceptable. So to do this, toxicologists typically have to extrapolate from animal studies. And because of that, they have to be extremely conservative to protect the most vulnerable people in the general population. These numbers, although they're very, very low, still aren't considered a safe dose. In an ideal world, we would never add carcinogens to building products intentionally. Since that's next to impossible, consumers and project teams find that they have to pay more attention. The design and building process can be used to screen these carcinogens out of certain materials, especially things like furniture, finished materials, and any other products that might lead to exposure for building occupants. One example people don't think too often about is something like duct linings. Those deliver the air that we breathe in our building, so it's important to know if there might be carcinogens in them. Okay, so just a few places that carcinogens, sorry, some carcinogens and where they're found. Um, some of these, like I was saying, are 100% natural, like arsenic, but that doesn't mean they're safe, and it doesn't mean we should increase our chance of exposure by specifying them in our buildings. So arsenic is found in pressure-treated wood, um, and it can actually leach into water from that wood, especially after it's disposed of in landfills. So it's not always just the um, interior, interior materials that are important. Um, asbestos which, of course, has to be removed very carefully from older buildings whenever it is found, now that we know how dangerous it can be. Um, another one is benzene. And again, we're kind of looking at the whole building life cycle here. Um, benzene is found commonly in cigarette smoke. Um, and we all know by now that smoking is bad for smokers and for the people who breathe their exhaled smoke. Uh, but now there's also more research showing that carcinogens and secondhand smoke can also get absorbed by interior building materials and be re-emitted later. This is called third-hand smoke, and it's another good reason to avoid smoking inside or near any indoor space that's going to be shared with other people. And finally, formaldehyde. Um, and many of these carcinogens that we look at are VOCs that can off-gas from building materials and also from cleaning products. Um, so even if they're so-called natural chemicals like formaldehyde, Keeping them out of our indoor air is a high priority. Um, so this is just a small screen capture from our handbook on toxic chemicals. And we'll show a few more of these as we go through. This one has some alternatives to treated wood products that contain arsenic. Um, and I guess we're a little short on time, so I'm, I'm going to just go to the next one. Um, so 
There are also some mainstream alternatives now to formaldehyde-based binders in manufactured wood products. Um, so here's the furniture page just showing good things to spec or not spec um, for interior furniture products. So you can also see that under the um, not that label, the VOCs are not the only issue with furniture, but that is a big one. Um, but you also see flame retardants and fabric treatments can also be a real concern. Great. So before I uh, move on to the next category, um, first of all, I want to apologize if there was a glitch in your view of the screen. Um, we had a temporary technical glitch here, but fortunately we got the screen back. I think we're in good shape now. And um, as Paula mentioned, these are screen captures from the report um, that we talked about at the beginning of the program. And what we've tried to do in the report is simplify the guidance down just as far as we possibly could. It's necessarily, in some cases, oversimplified. But um, our sense is that people need a place to start. And once you have a handle on where you can start looking into these things and some steps you can start to take, then you can begin to learn more and take a more nuanced view of what to uh, include or exclude from your specs. So hence the spec that's not that um, guidance that's in that report. I um, encourage you to take a look at that. Um, so the next category we're going to talk about is on uh, reproductive and developmental toxicants. And um, they can cause infertility. They can affect uh, sexual behavior or functioning. Um, they can also cause low birth weight, congenital defects and weaknesses. And some of these may not show up until later in life. And it's also important to know that um, they don't, the problems can come not necessarily only from direct exposure of a fetus, for example, but pre prior parental exposure um, could end up affecting a fetus as well. So these, the effects can be delayed and show up later in offspring, um, and sometimes not even in the fetus initially, but long after birth. So um, something to, to clearly uh, watch out for there. Um, taking a look next at what some of these things are and where you might find them or try to avoid them. Um, phthalates is a category of plasticizer. These are part of what make um, sheet vinyl products flexible. And um, so vinyl flooring, vinyl uh, wall coverings, shower curtains, things like that. Um, acrylamide is commonly found in certain kinds of adhesives. Uh, one and two bromopropane is an ingredient in some coatings, and ethylene glycol is a common solvent in many cleaning products. These are some of the places you want to look for this particular class of, of uh, developmental toxicant, and then try to identify some products that avoid them. And into our uh, spec this, not that meme from the report, um, you can see that we've provided some of that guidance for options that are not likely to include those ingredients. Um, and then ones that are likely to include them that might be best to avoid. And similarly with exterior coatings, uh, some choices there to focus on. OK, um, so just moving on to endocrine disruptors now, the third category that we're going to go into some detail on. Um, these chemicals are very difficult to study. You can get wildly different effects, even among humans, depending on age, sex, and susceptibility. So trying to learn how they might affect us by studying animals is even trickier um, than trying to study carcinogens using animal studies. But there are other challenges as well. Some endocrine disruptors are chemically similar to natural hormones, and they can keep our endocrine system from getting the right signals from our own hormones. They can disrupt just about every system of the body, not just reproduction. Hormones also play a large role in behavior, in our learning abilities, our immune systems, and our metabolism. So it's not a simple thing like finding a group of minors who all have the same kind of lung disease. Figuring out what causes these sometimes subtle changes can be extremely difficult to track. Some people think that endocrine disruptors may be part of what's behind the obesity epidemic and the recent increases worldwide in type 2 diabetes. One piece of evidence for this is that the epidemic is affecting not just humans, but also pets and laboratory animals who have not been intentionally exposed. 
One unique thing about endocrine, endocrine disruptors, which toxicologists are really just starting to learn more about, is that they may be more dangerous at very low doses. Our endocrine systems are designed to respond to very slight biochemical changes. It could, be, it could make regulating these chemicals very, very difficult. The good news is that when certain endocrine disruptors have been banned, like the pesticide DDT, for example, the amount that is carried in our bodies and the environment does eventually decrease. Um, so just a quick look at some places endocrine disruptors are found. Um, of course, we find them in our food, um, but also we'll find them in phthalates, just like um, the reproductive uh, toxins that we were talking about before. Um, and also um, epoxy, um, one of the reasons that we do find BPA in our food supply is that, um, especially in canned food, is that those cans are lined with epoxy. Um, the reason, uh, we have, let's see. So it's, it's there to keep us from getting botulism, basically. Um, but it's one of those cases where choosing between health and safety can be a real problem. Um, but we also find BPA in a lot of adhesives and sealants and in resins like polycarbonate. So most of us are familiar with the two-part epoxy tubes, like the ones in the picture. Um, and one of those tubes is basically just filled with BPA. So you can absorb BPA right through your skin from cash register receipts and from recycled paper that is made with those receipts. Another endocrine disruptor um, is PCBs, which you can still find in um, older buildings. Um, these were phased out years ago, but the EPA just last year released guidance for schools on getting old light ballasts out because they were leaking PC PCBs into classrooms. Um, and also old caulk has PCBs and it has to be removed as hazardous waste during major retrofits or renovations now, so that's just something to be aware of. Um, and finally, um, as we were talking about before, our efforts to stay, stay safe don't always protect us, kind of like with antibacterial soap and can linings. A lot of you probably saw the recent coverage in the Chicago Tribune and in the New York Times about halogenated flame retardants in foam furniture. Once that foam starts to fall apart, it gets into dust which we eat as a matter of course all the time. And our kids eat even more of it than we do. You know, another thing I didn't realize about that foam in the cushions is that every time you sit on a cushion, it's almost acting like a bellows. It's blowing air out of that cushion and carrying dust and whatever else is on that dust with it. Yeah. So that stuff gets distributed pretty quickly out of foam into wherever we are. Right. It really disintegrates um, fairly quickly. So foam is a good thing to avoid. Um, or you, there are some ways to get halogenated flame retardant free foam too. Um, so in the past, just looking at some of the materials and avoiding them, in the past VOCs were kind of a catch-all for what we need to avoid. Um, and that's a good start, but as we said, it doesn't tell the whole story. Um, so here are a few options that we have looked at for um, better adhesives. Um, that don't contain BPA or other hazards, or are less likely to. And um, then also looking at halogenated flame retardants, um, there are good options that do not have, um, for insulation that do not have those flame retardants in, um, and also for furniture, as we were saying. All right, so let's talk about VOCs for a few minutes, because many of these chemicals we've been talking about are also VOCs or volatile organic compounds. Uh, the term VOC means different things to different people. Um, essentially, VOCs are, are compounds that off-gas from products. Um, they're relatively easy to measure. And um, they may or may not be toxic in indoor air, and they may or may not contribute to smog. Um, in fact, there's uh, regulations have driven this categorization of both exempt and non-exempt VOCs. And where this comes from is that non-exempt VOCs are the ones that are regulated under air pollution laws. And they're the ones that contribute to smog. Um, and they're also the only ones that have to be included in the VOC content label on a can of paint or a tube of cock, for example. So um, exempt VOCs are no less volatile 
Um, they're still organic. They're still carbon-based compounds. They may or may not be just as toxic as non-exempt. But just because they don't react photochemically to produce uh, smog, they are exempted from the labeling requirement. So um, products or, or chemicals like dichloromethane and acetone, um, while they meet most definitions of VOC, they aren't necessarily going to be included in that label. In fact, they most likely will not be included in that label. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind as we start to move towards more sensitivity towards uh, health in the indoor environment, that distinction between exempt and non-exempt VOCs is starting to change. Um, the other thing it's good to understand is um, the different ways that we measure and talk about the amount of VOCs uh, in a particular product or material. Uh, for wet applied materials, and again, based on these air quality regulations, um, we typically talk about VOC content. So that's where you see the 50 grams per liter or the 400 grams per liter on the can of paint. Um, and that, again, that's driven by the regulations. It tells you what's in the product, but it doesn't really tell you how much of that might off-gas, what happens when it's applied to a substrate. Um, it's not going to include any SVOCs or semi-volatile organic compounds. And, of course, it's not also going to include um, the exempt ones. Another way that we measure VOCs is with emissions testing. So this is when you take a product, put it in a stainless steel testing chamber, and actually measure what's coming off of it. Um, regulations don't currently require this, but an increasing number of green building rating systems and certifications and green product certifications do. So programs like Fourscore and the Carpet and Rug Institute's um, Green Label Program um, are all based on VOC and Green Guard, are all based on VOC emissions testing. And this is actually more useful because it's going to include both exempt and non-exempt VOCs and also tell you a little bit more about what's actually coming off the product. Um, but still, it may or may not include uh, semi-volatile organic compounds, depending on how comprehensive the, uh, the testing is. And um, of course, many of these chemicals are also potentially PBTs in the sense that they're persistent and they bioaccumulate as uh, toxicants. And so the term PBT refers to persistent bioaccumulative toxins. Sorry, Paula, take it away. Okay. Um, I have one question. So one of the reasons that... Yeah, they, go ahead. Yeah, on the, uh, as far as lead goes, uh, <clears throat> on the upcoming version 4, are they going to move to testing versus VOC content? Um, yes, version, the proposed version 4 credits and lead um, rely, is it exclusively on testing or almost? They allow both? So um, the wet applied products, you have to know both the content and the emissions. And then the um, finished products are just the emissions. OK, thank you. So we're, we're moving, moving, moving towards the testing, but not away from the content yet, it sounds like. Right, right. Right, and part of the reason Sorry, go ahead. No, I'm all set. Thank you. Okay. Um, so now we're just going to move on to your quiz results. Um, and we, there were four different types of answers and representing four different approaches um, to toxic chemicals in kind of in your everyday life. Um, so to see which category you're in, just tally your scores from earlier in the talk. And remember, it was zero points for an A answer, one point for a B answer, et cetera. So if you got a zero, you're in the category we're calling Carpe Chemicolum. In other words, seize the chemical. Your motto is the Twitter hashtag YOLO, which stands for you only live once. Obviously, we're being a little bit silly here, but this is actually a very common response to our predicament. Remember that list of things that may be killing you? Well, you might as well have fun while you die. Okay, next um, set of answers. If you got one to four points on our quiz, you might just be in a chemical fog. In your work, you might adopt a red list with a few chemicals on it and then ignore the rest just to stay sane. Sure, some of your decisions might seem a little random or irrational, but the situation you're trying to deal with doesn't exactly make sense either. The next category is practical makes perfect. If you gave yourself five to seven points, you're trying to make the most of what you've got, even though it's not much. You probably use a lot of different tools in your work, including red lists, 
certifications, material safety data sheets, and calls to manufacturers. And finally, if you got eight or nine points on your quiz, you might just be a bubble girl or a bubble boy, like in this great comic strip by Jen Sorensen. The woman in this strip tried to buy a mattress and realized that every single option available to her was toxic. She decided to just live in a bubble, but afterward you can see her thinking, I hope this plastic is BPA free. If you start trying to eliminate every toxic substance from your building, you could quickly go crazy and end up like Bubble Girl. So these four approaches actually correspond to four typical ways that people deal with toxic chemical decisions in the real world. Keep in mind that there's not one right approach here, but as building industry professionals, you should be aware of which approach you think makes the most sense and how much knowledge you think your clients need in order to work with you in making the best decisions for their projects. So the first approach is simply to wait. You didn't sign up to be chief toxicologist, and some people get really overwhelmed and just decide to wait for regulations to deal with all these issues. The second approach is red lists, which can be super useful, but as Nadav showed us earlier, picking your red list can be difficult. Still, you really can eliminate a lot of risk just by keeping a handful of chemicals out of your projects. Third are certifications, which are certainly handy, but they also have their limitations. So if you're going to use them, make sure you understand what they do and don't tell you about a product. This is a good place to plug the report we've done on green product certifications as well, to help you understand that? <laughs> yes, that's a good point. Um, All right. Yeah, because, I mean, a lot of what we do is just looking at the way people are selling their products and whether it's an accurate way of selling them. Um, and the FTC just came out with its new green guides as well, you know, talking about making general environmental claims or health claims. Um, you need to, it's still an imperfect system, so you still need to be aware of exactly what it is that that label is telling you. Um, and then the final choice is total avoidance of all toxic chemicals, which is a great goal, but it's one that could drive you absolutely crazy if you tried it. You'll find that even sticks and mud have VOCs and PVTs in them. So there is a less drastic approach than total avoidance that does attempt to balance all four of these approaches. Um, the so-called precautionary approach says the preliminary evidence the chemicals might be toxic. It's something that we ought to respond to, but it's not actually an attempt at total avoidance, though it is sometimes interpreted that way. The basic idea is this. If there's evidence that a chemical might have really serious consequences for human health, even if we don't have all the details and statistics on the books yet, it's best to look for an alternative that is safer. So in terms of resources, um, to guide you as you work through this uh, kind of difficult um, situation. Um, I'm going to list just a few here. The, the report that we've been talking about, um, health product declarations and the Pharos tool. So this is the report. I um, can encourage you to take a look at it. It includes the spec this, not that pages that we showed and, and a bunch of others as well as a lot of background information um, on these different issues we've been talking about. Um, health product declarations uh, is a, this is a brand new thing. Um, it's just coming out, actually formally launching next month at GreenBuild, but it's been in pilot for this past um, six to nine months. And essentially it's a format uh, that we're encouraging manufacturers to use in reporting ingredients and the health hazards associated with those ingredients. So it's kind of like the next generation beyond um, a certain material safety data sheet. Um, in terms of detail that go beyond, as Paula mentioned earlier, MSB sheets uh, focus on acute hazards. Um, health product declaration is going to include also chronic and subchronic hazards with ingredients and just a much more comprehensive disclosure. The challenge, of course, is getting manufacturers to agree to be as transparent as they would need to be to fill out a uh, health product declaration. So it includes the content disclosure um, as well as health hazards involved. You can go to, uh, this is an interim website, the hpdworkinggroup.org. Uh, it's up until the formal launch of the product next month with a, with a new website and, and a whole new uh, campaign around it as well. But about 30 manufacturers participated in the pilot program, and a lot of large architecture uh, firms are behind this 
uh, this new reporting format. So uh, it should, uh, should gain some traction. It's also referenced in the latest draft of Lead V4. That's right. It is included in the latest draft of Lead V4 as a, as a reporting tool. Um, and finally, I want to talk about Pharos, which is both a building product library and a chemical and material library. And really, it's at its best with the interface between those two because it helps you um, both find products that are free of certain ingredients and or learn about the ingredients and products and the health hazards associated with those ingredients. So it's a good way you can filter on different red lists, you can save searches, you can share lists with other people on the team. Um, if you have not tried out Theros tool and are interested in um, understanding more about uh, ingredients and toxicity associated with those ingredients, so you should definitely take a look at it as well. So we're going to wrap up by just quickly uh, sharing with you a few um, examples of projects that have worked to avoid uh, toxic materials, toxic ingredients in the products they use. Um, starting with the uh, Hips Botanical Garden in Pittsburgh, uh, the photo you're looking at is the main um, greenhouse botanical garden, but their new building, uh, which was a learning center, is pursuing Living Building Challenge certification, so they had to screen for that entire um, Living Building Challenge red list and um, learn some interesting things in the process. Uh, one of which is that even if the manufacturers want to help you out, sometimes they don't have the information that you need. So there's a challenge for you. Uh, another botanical garden project, this one in Vancouver, uh, the Van Dusen um, Botanical Garden, the new visitor center there, um, is a great looking project, uh, also pursuing living building challenge. And um, their feedback is just that because they've gone to such effort to screen out um, toxic ingredients, they've got a building that feels and smells great and a happy client to boot. So um, it's a nice thing to have going for you. Um, Google is actually pursuing this kind of screening of ingredients on a, much, on a comprehensive basis across all their projects. And um, their main complaint is that uh, they feel like a, a lone voice in the wilderness trying to get manufacturers to be more transparent about what's in their products and to avoid some of these more toxic ingredients. And so they wish more organizations would join them. But they, um, they have a very rigorous program. And because they're building a lot of, uh, a lot, they're building out a lot of interior space and they're now building some new buildings as well, uh, they've got some pretty robust um, market pull as well. And so, Manufacturers are paying attention to what they're asking for. Okay, and finally, um, the project featured here is the St. Bar Bartholomew's and Royal London Hospitals, which is a huge project of the National Health Service in the UK. Um, and the project team, which included architects HOK and contractor Skanska, developed a red list of 10 chemicals to either remove or avoid from the project since it was a renovation um, plus a small amount of new construction. Um, it was partly removal and partly avoidance. So they made a few exceptions to their list and they had some major success of eliminating cadmium from the project. Um, the team said that starting early was absolutely the key to their success. All right. And so um, with that, we've got a few minutes left for questions. Very good. No um, are there any questions on the board? There are. There's uh, some comments slash questions here for you all. Um, we're going to give them to you here, and then I'll let you decide how you'd like to answer them. Um, how can an architect designer take a nuanced view when they have no training um, in the toxicology, epidemiology, or even mm -hmm. the basic um, statistics for studies, um, indicating here that um, without having a real knowledge of the chemistry or science um, at odds about the carcinogens, endocrines, disruptors, and et cetera, um, you know, how do we determine how these lists are being objectively made, um, knowing that for the most part we have a skill set in construction and design as opposed to um, science and medical behavior? Um, and then just a point on that indicating that um, both Ferros and HBN are, not also, are also not scientific organizations um, and where the concern is is how do we know um, the medical and science behind some of these lists and production of standards that are being developed. 
Wow, what a great question. Um, so the first thing I would say is, and this is the hardest thing I think for a lot of us to kind of comes to term with, is, is there's really no absolute right answer. Um, if you've studied um, the natural world or, or kind of anything in, in any depth, you know, one of the things I've discovered is that the closer you look, the more complicated things are. And so, um, and, and and certainly it's true in science, um, there really is never a conclusive final answer. Um, even the laws of physics are, are really just our best current working hypothesis until uh, until we get a better one, right? So, so we really are constantly, what we're faced with is kind of making the best choices we can with the available information. And you need to kind of find your own comfort level in terms of um, how much time and energy you want to put into educating yourself um, or alternatively finding organizations um, whose work and whose voice you trust to guide you in making these choices. So you either need to learn the science yourself or you need to learn enough about the organizations and institutions that are providing, that are setting the guidance, whether it's U.S. Green Building Council or the International Living Future Institute or the Healthy Building Network or us at Building Green or, or CSI, um, whatever organization you're going you're gonna to look to for guidance, you want to understand where they're coming from and what drives their guidance. Um, it's, it's always possible for, it's always possible to obfuscate and to take any recommendation that somebody would give and raise doubts about that. Um, we saw that happen for decades with the tobacco industry and how, you know, they didn't have to really show that tobacco was safe. All they had to do was so, so sufficient doubt about the science to uh, make the case that it was not yet time to do something about, uh, about limiting people's use of tobacco or encouraging people not to use, not to smoke tobacco. So um, because of the way science works, there's always some uncertainty involved and it's always possible to um, exploit that uncertainty and make the case that, you know, what actually is a hazard, you know, maybe might not be, so maybe it's not time to do anything about it yet. So I would say um, beware of the trap of trying to find total certainty on any of these things and, and just find your own comfort with either uh, sufficient weight of evidence to make these choices or, or with organizations you want to trust to guide you in them. Paula, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I guess I just wanted to add that Ferris is, um, and also um, Clean Production Actions lists are all based on um, red lists that basically regulatory organizations around the world have created um, as, you know, hazards that we want to keep out of the environment. Um, so it's, while HBN is not a research firm or anything like that, um, you know, they, they are kind of collecting a lot of data that's, you know, it's real hard data. Um, so it's not, they, they didn't just pull it out of thin air. I mean, I think you can kind of look and say, well, they're going too far. Um, but getting, you know, more information never hurts. All right. Okay, so we have about two minutes left to go, Matt. I have no other questions on my end. Oh, I don't know okay, that, you'd like to clarify. Yeah, that may be safe. Uh, I have one question about your handbook, Nada. Uh, that book or handbook is available to non-Building Green members, is that right? Uh, yeah, it's for sale through our website. Yeah, um, and is it, is it $100? Okay, is it $100 right currently? What's the, the cost of that handbook? <laughs> We're not sure. <laughs> We're checking on the price here. Uh, I think it's 95. 95, all right. Yeah, okay. Sorry about that. We should know that information. Yeah, for those interested parties, you can, you can go on billinggreen.com. Right. Okay. Thanks, Richard. Uh, sure. Uh, any closing remarks before we sign off here? We have two minutes to go. But I appreciate the, the great PowerPoint. Um, I also have the handbook, so, and I, I uh, thoroughly enjoyed um, reviewing that. It, it was very concise and uh, in uh, easy to understand language. 
Great. Well, thank you. I'm glad you found it useful. We've gotten great feedback on it um, from people mm -hmm. who've used it and, and gotten it. So, um, so that's really encouraging. It's always, as I said in the beginning, you know, we really um, deliberated long and hard about about trying to simplify the, the this complex information down to something as, as simple as spec this, not that. And so, you know, we recognize that. And, and in fact, in the report, there's some caveats around that. But um, but people are just desperate for any kind of guidance they can get, and we felt that uh, some guidance uh, is better than none. So we we've taken our stab at doing that, and we look forward to hearing from folks as well if, if they have suggestions about how we can make it better. Okay, with that, we're going to sign off. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. You have a great Thank day. You.